So this is uh, just uh, an intermediate step in the uh, process of this, of this wonderful Koch Symposium where we say goodbye to the Cancer Center and we say hello to the Koch Institute. And um, it's, it's only fitting, and certainly from my personal point of view, that this transition and the end of the first day's festivities is, is concluded by um, the introduction of David Baltimore. Was that David Hausman? It had to be David Hausman. I actually don't know who it was. David, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know that it was you. I would like to um, introduce David first by, again, beginning with a, with a small anecdote. Um, those of you who know me well know that I came on to biology and genetics and developmental biology and cancer research rather late. I, I was a theater student and then I was an engineering student and then for a variety of reasons that I don't have time to tell you tonight, although I assure you that they were all extremely interesting, um, <laughs> In the last semester of my junior year at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, I realized that I had a passion for research, but that the lead acid cell batteries that I was studying, with all due respect to Dr. Langer, was kind of boring. Um, I, I, I was basically training to become an electrochemist and a chemical engineer. But it occurred to me that it would be so much more interesting to study with living things, and that if research was what was really grabbing me. So I took a bold turn of events. I went and enrolled in Biology 101, Genetics 101, Biochemistry 101, all of the biology-related courses as a, as a second-year junior student at the University of Wisconsin. and. Um, then I, I, I really went head over heels and I, and I convinced a professor who taught a graduate level night seminar course to accept me in a course on animal virology. His name was Roland Ruckert and he, he worked on, on picornaviruses, these small RNA viruses that include poliovirus. And so here I was beginning a completely new career. Within three weeks I was convinced that I had found my métier, that I knew that this is what I was going to be doing for the rest of my life. But every Tuesday when I went to this animal virology course, it was completely way over my head. I mean, like, zoom, zoom, because I was just learning the principles of genetics and of bacteria at the basic course level. <clears throat> and Roland Ruckert began by telling us about picornaviruses and about this uh, single RNA genome and the genes that it, 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 it expressed. And um, the, the only things that I could sort of like digest as I was trying to understand all of this complex information that was beyond my education was that uh, Baltimore had done this and Baltimore had done that and that there were these viruses. And then, and then he moved on from the coronaviruses to the vesicular stomatitis virus. And again, it seemed like every kind of thing was, you know, Baltimore this and Baltimore that. And then we had a small segue where we moved into the real viruses and I didn't hear very much about Baltimore then. But then we went to the retroviruses and reverse transcriptase and Baltimore this and Baltimore that. And then, um, you know, uh, after that happened, they would say, but then, then retroviruses cause cancer and oncogenes and Abelson and Baltimore, this and Baltimore, that. And, and, you know, here I was just basically in a stunned, you know, I was like a deer in front of the headlights that all of the information that was coming through was way, way above me. And then the course completed and thankfully, Dr. Ruckert permitted me to pass just simply for attendance, I believe. But I said to myself, well, you know, I didn't get much from this course, but if ever I decide to do a PhD in virology, I'm moving to Baltimore. <laughs> because there is one hell of a virology institute there. God's truth. 
Now, a year later, I was accepted into MIT as a graduate student, and I decided during um, Thanksgiving break to hitchhike to Boston from Madison to see what the school was like. And, and I went around, and people were very nice to me. And um, I walked into the cancer center, and it was there on the first floor, and I put plugged it. And somebody got in with me, and it was this gentleman who was wearing an army fatigue jacket and a beard and long hair. And um, I said, you know, could, I'm, I've been accepted at MIT, and I would like to <laughs> meet a couple of the professors. I'm sure he doesn't remember this. But he said, come on up. And then, uh, you know, we went up, and he said, well, I'm David Baltimore. And I walked into his office, now Tyler's office, and he told me everything about what he was doing. He was incredibly gracious. I'm sure he doesn't remember this. I walked out of there sort of in a state of shock and went back to Madison, Wisconsin and said, I'm moving to MIT. So on that particular occasion, I knew that there had to be an institution that was Baltimore. And what, what I didn't realize that it wasn't in Maryland, that it was an institution within MIT. And um, everything that I've learned afterwards has absolutely, completely fulfilled all of my expectations of those very early, naive, and ignorant notions. Uh, because you all know David Baltimore, and I, I don't have to tell you so much more. You've already been reminded today of his uh, incredibly seminal contributions um, to the Center for Cancer Research. Um, you know about his, if, if you don't, I'll tell you that he was figuring out the uh, proteins and viruses that mediated the replication and the construction of these viruses at a time where from shortly after his move from Swarthmore to the Rockefeller, I think he must have been an extremely famous graduate student for his work on polioviruses. Then he went to the Salk Institute, and then uh, luckily for MIT, he went to MIT. Um, so you can measure science and scientific accomplishment by a variety of, of, of sort of mathematic calculations. And obviously, the quality and the number of papers matter, and David is there. You, you can think about um, leadership, and David is there. So when you, when you consider the whole scenario, um, this is an individual who has written textbooks that we all read and that continue to educate our young scientists. This is an individual who not only um, switched from this virus to that virus to that virus, but that had the prescience to um, get interested in retroviruses and then the idea that the central dogma that those of you who are beyond a certain age was incorrect and that there was in fact a um, reverse transcriptase that had tremendous implications, not only for the concept of biology, but for the pragmatic aspects of, virology, of biology. We all used reverse transcriptase to be able to do all of the things that we did thereafter, which is why the Nobel Prize um, came so rapidly and, and at a, such a young point. Now, you might suggest that somebody who had, you know, flared so quickly, so rapidly, and so brightly might get a little bit bored with the idea, but that certainly was not the case. What, what came after, and I, I won't measure all of these things, and I won't pretend to tell you all of them, but certainly, if you think about NF-kappa-B, and you hear how many times NF-kappa-B was mentioned, today in the scientific talks. You know how profound that discovery was, and uh, certainly the RAGs, the recombinases of the immune system. The adoption of retroviruses, just from using it to discover reverse transcriptase, to recognizing that this Abelson oncogene could capture hematopoietic stem cells in distinct periods of their differentiation so that we could molecularly capture all of the intermediates of their rearrangement was mind-boggling. 
But that was just one of the laboratories. There was the Oncogene Laboratory, the, immu the Immunology Laboratory, the Polio Laboratory. So when we consider the magnitude of the science, it, it itself is, is, is hard for me to imagine it. it. I'm so privileged to have observed this from close for many years. But then when you layer on top of that the mentorship, and this is something that I can speak to personally because David, Bob Weinberg is my man, but Dave Baltimore was a mentor to all of the people in, in the campus and he cared about them tremendously. Um, and I want you to know that uh, that, that never ceased and, and the evidence in that is in all of the people that have achieved greatness that were trained by David Baltimore. And I'm not just speaking about members of the National Academy or et cetera, but just simply of the science that comes after David that actually supersedes the first generation, but that it is already in the second generation. In addition, David has been a spokesperson for science and for biomedical research of singular importance. Um, from Charlie Rose, where I've watched him, to Congress, to wherever he has been, he has been an articulate, articulate thoughtful, and comprehensive spokesperson. And um, there are not that many people who can create an institute on day one called the Whitehead Institute and have it essentially arrive on the map as one of the most important biomedical research institutes essentially at that particular moment. Um, so the accomplishment is huge. He has, in, he has used his leadership not only to represent us all at all of the world and national forum, but he has also been a leader not only at MIT, but at the Rockefeller, at Caltech. And David Baltimore is, is really nonetheless synonymous in my view and always will be with MIT. He is um, a role model that has accomplished incredibly well something that many of us wish to aspire to and has been an inspiration. So David, it's a huge honor to introduce you tonight.